Hello, and welcome to The John Ark Show. On today's episode, we're going to interview actor and retired special ATF undercover agent, Jay Dobbins. As an actor, Jay has appeared in a modern crime classic called Den of Thieves, starring Gerard Butler. As an undercover agent with the ATF, Jay has been involved in more than 500 undercover operations involving violent crime, investigations, weapons and narcotic trafficking, infiltration of the Hells Angels, and murder for hire cases. Jay's also the author of a New York Times bestseller called No Angel, My Harrowing Undercover Journey to the Inner Circle of the Hells Angels, which chronicles his career and his extraordinary infiltration of the Hells Angels. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to subscribe, like, follow, and comment on the show. Also, I'd like to tell you about a service called HollywoodIsCalling.com. It allows you to purchase live phone calls with more than 100 celebrities, a live 15-second call is 1995, and a live 30-second call is 2995. So give it a try for yourself or for as a gift for somebody you know. HollywoodIsCalling.com. So now, without any further ado, let's talk to Jay. Hello, Jay, and welcome to the John Ark Show. How are you today, sir? I'm good. Thank you for having me, and welcome to your audience. Um, so we checked you out uh, very thoroughly, and uh, it's quickly, and we've quickly come to the conclusion that uh, your real-life work in law enforcement makes James Bond and Indiana Jones look like a bunch of rodeo clowns. Uh, you had a really serious career. That is uh, very kind. I, I don't take myself uh, super serious, but I appreciate the kind words. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so tell me about your earlier life prior to law enforcement. Um, what do you think happened in your youth that uh, turned you in, into such an effective law enforcement officer? Well, probably the biggest uh, element of my youth was my parents, my upbringing. I was raised in a blue collar family. My father was a carpenter. My mom was a house cleaner. They were uh, just work first, play second people. And the element of both their lives that I embraced was just toughness. That's, that's, they're just tough people, uh, good people, kind people. But one of the lessons my dad repeatedly taught me over and over as a young man was you have to get up. You are going to get knocked down. And guess what? No one's coming to help you. The world is not coming to save you. No one feels sorry for you. When you get knocked down, People that are successful and people that are achievers find a way to get back up and keep moving forward. So were your parents uh, born in the U.S. or were they immigrants? They were both uh, born in the United States, raised outside Chicago uh, in the Calumet region area of uh, northwest Indiana. And they were just blue collar, hardworking grinders. Right. So what were the events that led you to joining the ATF? Well, that's, uh, it's, I'll try to make a long story short with that answer, but truthfully, I was a failed athlete. Um, I had always believed that I was going to be a professional athlete. I played football in college. I had a very nice, successful college football career. When it came time to become a professional, um, I, I went into that process with all the confidence in the world. And then I realized very quickly that I just wasn't good enough. I did not have the skills to compete on the level that I believed I did. Um, I never had a plan B in my life. I only had plan A's. So when my uh, football career stopped, like I was lost. Like a lot of young people, I was lost. And um, I knew more of what I didn't want than what I did want. Um, I, I never chased money that wasn't important to me. I wanted a job that when my alarm clock went off in the morning and I put my feet on the ground, I was excited and felt good about doing something to help benefit other people. So uh, when you uh, finally did join the ATF, uh, was it like you thought it would be, like you saw in the movies, or did it turn out differently? Well, I think Hollywood creates uh, a false image of police life, of Copland for us. Um, 
the sexy, glamorous uh, world that you know that intrigued me that I saw in the old Miami Vice television show with uh, Sonny Crockett and the Hugo Boss suit driving the Lamborghini around South Beach and, and all the glamorous people he was involved in. Once I touched it, I realized that that world was a nasty, dirty, bloody, vomit-covered scab of a life. But I also realized that I loved it. I loved my job. I embraced my job, even on the bad days. So tell me about uh, your very first undercover operation. Um, how old were you, and what was it like to be in a room full of killers and criminals? Um, it was a bit overwhelming. You know, I started working undercover very early in my career. Um, uh, over the course of 27 years, I was involved in over 500 undercover operations. Um, but those early ones, there's really no way to train for those. There's no way to prepare yourself. You just have to jump in. It's a trial by fire. And you have to test yourself and test your skills and then build that knowledge and that tradecraft that will ultimately allow you to do more, become more successful. Um, but th th yeah, it's, 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 it was overwhelming for me initially until I kind of caught my stride and started uh, building my persona and, and figuring out who I wanted to portray and how I wanted to portray that person. Hmm. So I know that a lot of police officers have a great ability to evaluate criminals, uh, you know, the, the, the criminals they interact with uh, during their undercover operations, you know, and that those criminals are always probing and testing and challenging. Uh, were you ever challenged or tested early on by any of the groups you were uh, running an undercover operation against? Well, you know, very much so. Uh, the, the criminal community, uh, people that are involved in organized crime and violent crime, they are uniquely paranoid. More, more paranoid probably than even a normal, everyday paranoid person is. They act that way and operate that way because they have to. They have to be paranoid. That is how they stay out of jail. That's how they stay out of prison, is by conducting themselves with a lack of trust, um, and they evaluate and assess everything about you, how you look, how you talk, how you walk, the clothes you wear, the car you drive, where you live, um, all those things. They're looking for a hole in your story that they can pick at and try to uh, uncover if there's anything there to uncover about you that is compromising you. Now, did they ever... Uh uh, ask you anything that was uh, really, really difficult to deal with? For example, like introduce us to your family or let's meet your father or something that really would have compromised you. Did, did any of those tests ever come up? Yeah, those are normal tests. Um, we have uh, tradecraft solutions to some of those things. Uh, we have uh, kind of in our back pocket role players that can step up and, and occasionally play those types of roles. Um, so really, when you're in that world, nothing's off limits. If someone is going to be trusting you with their life, if someone is trusting you with the business they're involved in, the criminal activity they're in, you're not in a position to tell someone, man, you can't ask me that, or I'm not going to answer that, because they're, they're letting their guard down. Um, and so no questions are off limits. So when you got to know the criminals that you had infiltrated, after a while, did you get a sense for who in the room was just your average run-of-the-mill killer and who you really had to work uh, to, uh, to wonder about or worry about because, you know, these guys had to be taken very, very seriously? Well, yes. Uh, and I felt like I was pretty good at that, but I was never 100% accurate. Um, I, I think in an undercover role, you never completely lose the human factor. Um, you're around people and you see them at times doing violent, despicable, treacherous things. But when you spend enough time around them, an extended period of time around them, you also see sides to their life that aren't necessarily bad. You see elements to their personality and to their character that you like or that you admire. And so, you know, I learned 
you know, the bad guys aren't always all that bad, and the good guys aren't always all that good. Were they more dangerous uh, when they were drunk or high, or were they more dangerous when they were uh, straight? You know, I'll tell you when I felt they were the most dangerous is when there was numbers. Um, you can have one individual who might be a very uh, violent person, but one-on-one, -on -one, you have a, a, a fair chance to contain that situation, to de-escalate that situation if it gets out of hand. But then when he's got two of his friends with him, or three, or sometimes in some of the operations I was in, 10 or 50 or 100, they ramp each other up and they spin each other up. And then uh, a couple undercovers or an undercover that's working by himself in an environment like that, it can get out of control very fast. So when you're uh, involved in these operations and you're and you're watching the leaders of some of these groups, was the leader almost always the most violent guy, the, the deadliest guy, or was it usually the smartest guy in the room? Um, I think there's a combination. I'm not sure that there's one uh, narrative that fits universally. Um, I think intelligence it is a, a huge factor. I think charm is a factor. Your ability, personality, and your ability to convince people to follow you, uh, to believe in what you say and think and do, um, that's, those are inherent leadership traits that um, they're not unique to anywhere. I mean, it's the same skill sets that people that use to run Fortune 500 companies. They're just being applied into the, into the criminal world. What was most important as far as surviving and thriving in this environment? Was it getting them to like you, getting them to respect you, or getting them to fear you a little bit? Oh, um, the most important element. Um, I think building trust is the key, building relationships. Um, when you're operating undercover in the criminal community, really what you're trying to do is you're trying to build relationships. And that's no different than any successful um, uh, relationship or situation in civilian life or in real life. The more time you spend with someone, the more you learn about them, the more they learn about you, you start to develop trust, which brings loyalty, uh, in some cases, it brings love, um, and it's you know it's it, it breaks down to the boy girl of the world, um, the boy girl situations, and it goes all the way up to families, relationships, uh, criminal organizations, uh, large corporations. Um, they're all ultimately successfully built on trust and whatever level of trust you can obtain. Now, were all these crime groups and gangs, were they all male members, or did some of them have female members? Um, the organizations that I worked on, there were females involved. Um, most, if, if probably not any, had females in leadership roles. Um, but there's no mistake that whether they're a member, a formal member of the organization or not, women have a huge impact on decisions and, and what people do. And uh, the women in some of these leaders' lives uh, may not have held the title of a member, but they no doubt affected uh, that person's decisions and, and how they did things and how they felt about things. Were, were most of the women sort of ancillary, like girlfriend roles, or were some of them killers who did what they were told to do? Uh, both. There was everything from uh, wives who were distant, girlfriends who were distant, uh, children who were more remote, to others who were very much involved in in day to day operations, or at least knowledgeable of what was happening. And uh, again, their loyalty to uh, their husband, their father, their boyfriend, um, in essence, made them dangerous too. Because if you crossed. Uh, whoever they were following, you in essence were crossing that. And uh, you could never take the women in any of these situations for granted or neglect them or brush them off as a non-threat because that was, that was never the case. You know, were the leaders of these groups, were they good businessmen or is that really not important when you have these enormous profit margins that you do in the drug world? 
Yeah, um, some were more than others. Uh, some were very good uh, at building organizations, building structure, uh, uh, forming uh, support groups underneath them uh, as part of their leadership structure. Others were just operated just purely on violence and intimidation and, and getting their way through uh, physical power and through fear uh, versus intellect. Now, did any of these people or organizations ever suspect you that you were, in fact, law enforcement? Yeah, there were times when uh, my cover was compromised, where it was challenged, it was questioned. Um, over the course of time, if you do this long enough, you begin to anticipate those situations. You build the tradecraft and the answers to react to whatever given relationship you've been building. Um, but those are inevitable. And they've also questioned people who were not cops about being cops. There's other criminals that they question about being a cop. Um, that's not unique just to uh, an undercover officer. It happens all the time with all of them. What were the groups that you infiltrated? I know you infiltrated the Hells Angels. What were some of the other groups that you infiltrated? I did, you know, um, over the course of 27 years um, in my undercover roles, I mean, I, I went on the street and bought everything from a Saturday night special pea shooter in the park to shoulder launch rockets. I bought everything from street corner dope, dime bags and eight balls up to cartel of the um, I bought uh, homemade PVC pipe bombs up to servo-activated remote control C4 IEDs. Um, I worked, I played the role of a hitman in murder for hire schemes. I infiltrated uh, home invasion groups. Um, as an ATF agent, um, our focus, our jurisdiction was on, you know, kind of the tools of the trade for violence, uh, firearms and explosives, uh, narcotics. Um, but in these organizations, really, we were, we were chasing and looking for the most violent people. That, that was always my challenge and always my focus, to try to find the most violent person I could in whatever organization I was targeting. And what was the strategy behind pursuing the most violent? What was the, uh, the process? What, did you think they would be the easiest to turn into informants? Is that it? No, I think that that was how we were trying to make our biggest impact in keeping our community safe. Okay. Is that if we could uh, impact the violence, um, who was orchestrating the violence, who was ordering it, who was uh, conducting it, who was operational in the nuts and bolts of it, who was supplying it with the weapons used, all those elements were our best, uh, offered our best ability to impact the communities we were working in um, and keep the, the good and innocent people there safe. Hmm. So at some point you decide to infiltrate the Hells Angels. What is the first step? How do you make contact? Do you just knock on the clubhouse door? Do you need an introduction? How does this work? Right. Yeah, it's not, it's not quite that easy. It's not, you don't knock on the door and ask for an application. Uh, it's, it, you know, it, it goes back to an earlier answer. It takes time. With time, you build trust. You start exposing yourself to them. As they, uh, as the members of the Hells Angels were getting to know me, I was getting to know them. Um, and so, it, 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 like anything, just like a boy-girl relationship, it takes time uh, and, and knowledge of the person to, to build that trust and build that loyalty so that you ultimately believe in someone and begin to let your guard down. So what does the inside of a Hell's Angels clubhouse look like? What's going um, on? Yeah, I don't know that there's necessarily one answer to that question. I've been in them from everything that were pretty rough and pretty run down to some that were like full-on Hell's Angels museums that were covered in gold and covered in trophies and plaques and posters and and uh, promotion uh, memorabilia and um, everything from the highest end of, of what in essence would be a Hell's Angels museum to some that like you wouldn't want to touch anything for fear of getting hepatitis. So at some point, you know, you're, you're part of the group on some level, and I'm sure they start asking you to commit crimes with them. 
You know, what were those early crimes like? Well, we knew that was coming. We knew that that was part of the test drive that would take place for us to gain uh, access into the, into the game. And so we stayed a step ahead of them. We started setting up uh, what we called street theaters, which were orchestrated plays that would put me in, for example, the middle of a gun deal, the middle of a drug deal, uh, the middle of an assault, a debt collection, an intimidation. And in these street theaters, I would allow the Hells Angels, I would bring members of the Hells Angels with me to see me in all these crime elements. What they didn't realize is that many times it was a play. It was, it was a scripted performance that was being put on for them. Because, as anyone knows, when you see something with your own eyes and hear it with your own ears, you believe it. And what we were doing is we were running hoaxes on them to avoid those very situations you mentioned. We wanted to stay in control of that environment versus having situations and terms dictated to us that we couldn't control. So when these criminal groups go on a job or engage in some sort of criminal activity, do the members all have to uh, leave their cell phones in the car or at home so that law enforcement cannot track them? Is that, is that a rule these days, or is that really not the case? I don't know that it was a rule that I was ever uh, exposed to. There were times when um, at some uh, like gatherings, uh, meetings, gang meetings, everybody had to turn their cell phone off and, and, and turn it in and have it taken out of the room so they could avoid being recorded um, or tracked. It's probably not a bad rule, to follow, but I didn't found I didn't I never found that it was generally or universally a prerequisite to commit crime. Yeah, I know a lot of organized crime groups will you know for, forcibly remove the cell phones of everybody coming into a room or going somewhere. So I just assume that was uh, pretty common. Um, in fact, some cities are now in uh, installing street lamps with built-in uh, video cameras and microphones that record what's being said and done by passerbys. So that's complicating things a lot for, you know, for that. The, uh, the advancement of uh, electronic surveillance and technology is, uh, it, it has to be a threat to people that are, that are doing things they shouldn't do. Uh, and our ability to use it and deploy it and not necessarily uh, even be aware that it's present uh, is, is helping solve crimes every day. So which of the gangs or groups that you infiltrated do you think was the most organized and effective and maybe even profitable? Wow. Um, the Hells Angels definitely had a very regimented structure. Uh, they had lower level soldiers to uh, bosses, to, to underbosses, to capo chieftains, much structured much like traditional organized crime. Um, I worked uh, the Aryan Brotherhood. I worked an Aryan Brotherhood case, which I found the structure to be much more loose and independent, at least outside the prison system. Inside the prison system, I, I believe they have a very uh, strict hierarchy. Outside, it was more every man for himself. Um, I worked a militia case um, in the mid 90s following the bombing of. Uh, Timothy McVeigh's bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma City. Um, I worked a case that had a tie to that explosion, and uh, much was the same there. It was very uh, loose, loosely organized, but with uh, uh, members and associates with violent attitudes that were very much willing to come together to accomplish a common goal. Were, were, the, big, were the biggest profits made by the sale of drugs? Uh, oftentimes, because that's such a, a, a big turnaround, right? if, if you have uh, an import connection and can acquire narcotics, you know, at a low price, um, and then you have distributors that can that can distribute it on the street, the markup for narcotics is huge. But like one of the roles we played with the Hell's Angels was as gun runners, and we reversed that scheme on them, and it made sense. We played the role in the eyes of the Hells Angels to be uh, acquiring firearms and taking them into Mexico where 
a firearm is worth 10 times as much in Mexico as it is in the United States. You know, we can acquire guns relatively easy and relatively cheaply in the United States. You can't do that in Mexico. So that uh, that role of playing a gunner in the eyes of the Hells Angels and our explanation that it was like reverse drug trafficking. We were buying low our weapons in the United States and selling high in Mexico. And it made sense to them because it was, it was logical and it was true. So let's do something interesting. Let's discuss salaries and income in this world. Uh, in, in Detroit, in New York, in Los Angeles, uh, a lot of the gangs that sell drugs on street corners, these young kids will stand on a street corner for 10, 12 hours a day, and they don't make nearly as much as uh, the people think they do. Tell me about uh, the biker gangs or some of the other organizations. What does a low-level killer make? What does a capo make in a, in a year? Um, did you see any trends or see any numbers at any point? What, and what does a gang leader make? Uh, you know, there's no set number. There's no salary structure for them. Um, they operate to some extent by the charters and operate to some extent independently. Um, I'll tell you this, though. If you go uh, to the Canadian Hells Angels, the, the, the Hells Angels north of the border, that are very much a part of the organized crime world there, very much a part of the narcotics trafficking world. Um, the profits that, that they generate from uh, massive uh, amounts of narcotic trafficking and, and big dollar transactions. Obviously, the profits are higher, but like any business, usually the guy down on the street, the guy getting his hands dirty, the guy on the loading dock that's uh, driving a forklift or filling a truck, he's not making as much money as the CEO. Um, he's doing all the work. He's the one that's getting his hands dirty. He's the one that's down in the weeds. But there's always someone up above that is truly collecting the big problems, whether it be in business or in organized crime. Now, did you ever were you ever invited to the homes of any of these uh, any of these guys or leaders or capos? And did any of those homes look like the home of someone who was making more than a million a year? Um, there were some nice houses. Um, there were some some real rough ones too. Um, I, I, I worked uh, against people, some of which had jobs, like legitimate jobs, legitimate, uh, everyday, uh, respectable employment that were paying them hundreds of thousands of dollars a year outside of their criminal activity. I also worked, you know, against people that didn't have two nickels to rub together and were just looking for any hustle that they could come up with to try to put some money in their pocket. Um, the affluence of these people was 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 very much an individual and very much their own responsibility. Um, they would work together when they needed to, but they would break off and work independently at times as well. Did you get the feeling that they were hiding most of their affluence, or was that really not part of the plan? I think that they, especially with the Hells Angels, I think they've become very much uh, improved in that area. I think they're. Uh, less visible. I think they took some strong lessons from traditional organized crime and, and probably became less flamboyant, less flashy. Um, but nonetheless, when you're in an outlaw motorcycle gang, when you put that gang's vest on your back, um, you're advertising the organization you're with. You're putting a, 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 you're putting a bullseye on your back for everyone to see. You're announcing what you're about. Whereas, um, like in a traditional organized crime structure, in a, in a cartel structure, um, you don't always know who you're dealing with. You don't always see what the hierarchy is. Um, with these guys, with the biker gangs, they'll put their rank right on their vest at times. They'll put their names right on their vest and where they work and the city and state they're in. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different culture. It definitely is. It has different protocols and bylaws and standards and rules. You know, I've always thought that that just made committing these crimes so much more difficult when you wore that vest and told everybody who you were and where you're from. I've always thought that was an issue. And, and I've been on um, Hell's Angels, uh, at Hell's Angels crime events where I was told, 
not to wear my vest. We're not wearing anything that's going to identify us for those very reasons. So I'm hearing that the Mexican cartels now prefer human trafficking over drug trafficking because it's so lucrative and the criminal penalties are much smaller. Is, is that your understanding as well, or is that just a rumor? Well, you know what? And then it's, it, you, you truly see uh, when you're in this world, in an undercover world, um, how, how terrible one human being can treat another human being in order to make money or to make a profit. Um, the, the, the role of human trafficking, uh, those, those, those women, like in the sex trafficking element or the human trafficking element, are recyclable goods. Uh, especially in the sex trafficking uh, world. Because if I'm a narcotics dealer, when I sell you my drugs, it's typically a one-time transaction. You might come back for more drugs, but I've got to buy more drugs. If I am in control of women or girls as a sex trafficker, I can recycle my product over and over and continue to make money with it. Um, which is, it's, it's, it's the true tragedy of, of the people that are caught up in this, the women that are caught up in this, and the girls that are caught up in it, is that they're victimized and recycled for, for, for someone's you know, personal profit with absolutely zero concern for that. Um, so um, were, were any of the organizations that you infiltrated migrating to white collar crime or computer crime or did it still did it remain primarily drugs, prostitution, trafficking, weapons? Um, I think you know the big ones, the obvious ones are always there, but um, the top organizations they're just looking for ways to make money. And however, it's you know it's uh, if it's uh, if it's computer fraud, if it's uh, if it's the hacking world, if it's credit cards, if it's counterfeit currency. Um, it's not always violent. It's, it's not always gun to your head, blood in the streets, uh, violence that these criminal organizations are involved in. Uh, they're involved in sneaky, covert, silent uh, elements of criminality as well, all designed with obviously putting money in the pockets of the criminals. Now, did any of these folks teach you any worthwhile criminal skills like how to pick a lock or how to make a fake credit card or any of that? Did you ever pick up any of those things along the way? I, I was around a lot of it. I don't know that I was ever uh, like personally instructed on how to open a safe or, or anything like that. But did I see those things? Yeah. Did I see people that had great expertise in it? Sure. Did I see uh, people that could take a semi-automatic uh, assault rifle and turn it into a machine gun? Uh, on a workbench, sure. Um, did I see people fabricating false IDs and uh, and doing those kind of things that took like very specific skill sets to become masterful at? Yeah, of course. So there is a new company out there that is selling some really interesting technology. It's called Pervasive Wide Area Surveillance Camera. And what it does is they put it on a plane or a drone and they'll, they'll, they'll put it up in the sky for 24 to 48 hours at a stretch. And unlike other cameras, this has a very large image sensor. And this sensor can survey a 32 square mile area continuously night and day with super high resolution. And, and what's happening is, uh, let's say you, you have a crew of bank robbers. And at 3 o'clock, they, they, they rob a bank and then they disappear. So what law enforcement does is they download the citywide video from this system, this pervasive wide area surveillance system, and then they, they go to the, the moment of the crime and then they reverse the video. They go backwards for a day or two to see where these guys live, where they travel, where their girlfriends are, and then they go forward until they find out where they are now. And, and I'm thinking that's got to make crime, uh, crime really, really difficult when it becomes, you know, nationwide. It, it feels to me that, like, you're telling me that, like, that um, in theory it sounds uh, amazing. Uh, reality and practically, um, I would love to see that put in use. Any technique, any, any uh, equipment that we can use to gain knowledge in law enforcement is a benefit to us. 
Knowledge is power. The more we know about uh, a criminal, an organization, uh, and all those little small micro details are, are power. They're valuable to us. So if, if there's a, a tool out there um, that can be used to give us knowledge, give us information, um, man, I, I, I've never heard of that. It sounds amazing, but I'm all for it. Yeah, if you Google it, you'll be amazed at the stories you see. So uh, the CIA uses uh, disguise artists, uh, special effects people, uh, to conceal people's identities with all sorts of elaborate disguises. Did any of the groups you worked with employ disguises, facial disguises? Um, I had uh, uh, criminals that would sometimes try to uh, alter their identity or uh, make themselves appear different to continue to operate without being as easily as identified. But, you know, I'm a movie fan. So like the movie uh, Argo about the, the CIA agent sneaking yeah. the, uh, the hostages out of Iran. Um, just, you know, just a, just an amazing, uh, not, not so much a makeup uh, altering, but uh, that elaborate cover story and, and having everybody have a role to play. Um, I was so impressed by that story and by what they were able to pull off with with people that weren't professional undercover operators. They were amateurs that were being coached um, and, and, and taught these roles uh, with the highest risk on the line. Their lives were on the line if they failed to perform well. So you had this incredible story about how at one point you have to prove to the Hells Angels that you can be trusted so you commit a murder. Can you tell us about that? Very early on in my uh, association with them, I asked the Hells Angels leadership, what am I supposed to do if I cross paths with a mom? And the Mongols were a motorcycle gang that the Hells Angels had been in a 50-year bloodbath war with. They are recycling over and over. My instructions were, it's your job to kill it. So I put that information in my back pocket towards the end of our uh, operations about two years had gone by, and I told the Hells Angels that I had become aware of a Mongol in Mexico um, that was bad-mouthing the gang and making threats, and I wanted to go to Mexico to kill him, to handle that business for the gang. Um, the Hells Angels gave me the firearm to do it and gave me instructions on how they want it done. Um, my partner and I went out in the desert. We dug a shallow grave. Um, we had uh, our Mongol uh, duct tape behind his back at the wrist, at the ankles, uh, beaten with a baseball bat, pushed in the grave, uh, shot in the head. Uh, we took pictures of the murder scene of the homicide. We cut the Mongols' vest off his back. We returned all that evidence to the Hells Angels and said, here we are. This is, you know, we, we've proven that we've got what it takes. The reply to that was exactly what we hoped for. Yes, you've shown that you can take care of business. And members of the gang took their vests off and put them on us. What they didn't realize is that the entire operation was a fabrication. It was a hoax. The Mongol that we quote unquote killed in the desert was a member of our task force. Um, we dug the shallow grave. We dressed him up in the enemy's colors. We used blood and guts from uh, the butcher shop to build a homicide scene. We documented it with pictures. We took evidence away from this man-made homicide um, and delivered them to the Hells Angels and then used all those things to sell them that we had committed a murder on their behalf. Uh, so after this happened, after you proved yourself, was there anybody in the gang that still didn't trust you? Yeah, I think there was always people that were skeptical. Um, I think it's always very safe and it's always entertaining to me after the fact. Um, after you run an operation, after you run an undercover hustle on somebody, there's always some guy who's going to say, I knew, I knew all along, I never trusted you. Um, typically, the people that are uh, using that response to being caught are the ones that believed it the most, are the ones that were the most tricked by the scheme you ran on, and they're just trying to diffuse that and save some face. So there are a handful of crime movies out there, some real classics, Heat, The Godfather, some others, that are just extraordinary. They're instant classics. 
One movie came out not too long ago called Den of Thieves with Gerard Butler. And I understand that, uh, that you were in that movie. How did all that come about? Um, I was. I had a very small role in the film. Um, I, I had a bigger role as uh, the law enforcement consultant uh, to the director and to the actors. So the actors that were playing the cops um, were in plain clothes, undercover type roles, undercover type assignments. And so I worked with those actors. I worked with the writer director uh, for years, actually, prior to the actual filming. And then when the movie was filmed, I mean, I was on set every day trying to help uh, those actors uh, portray authentic characters. Um, and, and they really wanted to do that. It was super important to them that when someone, especially someone from the law enforcement community, saw that film and watched their performance, that that audience would say, Man, that guy got it right. He was, you know, he sounded and acted and looked and talked the way that it is in in real life. And so, in those instances where these actors translated real world to a performance in front of a movie camera, then I mean, those were the days we really succeeded, and and, and I was able to do my job. It, and it shows because I'll, I'll give you an example. Gerard Butler's movies just keep getting better and better. And he's really good in this movie. But, you know, I'm a big Michael, Michael Mann fan. Michael, Michael directed Heat. And you can see the amount of training that went into the preparation there. And I got the same sense here while watching Den of Thieves. Um, so it really, it really does show up on the screen. I, uh, I spent a lot of time with Jerry. I actually became very close with him over the years, preparing him for this role. Um, he's a great mimic. He, he sees and hears things. He's got a very brilliant mind. He traps them. Um, he's able to replicate them, recall them, uh, little things, mannerisms um, that, that he is able to, uh, to recreate in front of a camera. Um, even down to the the tattoos that he had in that film were all based on uh, authentic, real law enforcement officers where he would see something and he'd say, like, I want to make a part of that my character. So uh, from the point of first contact, where uh, I'm assuming the production company reached out to you, to the first day of filming, how much time was that? Oh, probably uh, at least a dozen face-to-face -face meetings with Gerard Butler. Um, years of tweaking the script, trying to make sure that the dialogue was authentic, that the dialogue, uh, that the cop dialogue uh, fit the scene, fit the situation, fit the character, um, fit the actor that was cast to play that character. Um, and then, uh, you know, on the set, we were on the set for probably 90 days, uh, bulk of that film, although the film is based, uh, uh, the events are based in Los Angeles, the bulk of that filming took place in Atlanta. Um, really? And so, uh, you know, they, it's, it's movie magic, man. They made Atlanta, you know, they made you believe you were in Los Angeles for, for much of that film. Um, but there were, there were years. It was, it was years of, of polishing that script and polishing that those characters, I had a very small part in the grand picture of the development of the film. My role um, was, was, was actually very small with regards to like, some of the elements of, of all the other people involved. You know, um, it shows in the quality of the film. Um, and I have to say the casting was really good. The antagonist, uh, the gang leader that, uh, that Gerard was chasing throughout the movie, he was really good. Uh, that was an actor named Pablo Schreiber, um, who's uh, a young actor, very talented, very confident. Uh, um, and I, I was super impressed with, um, with these actors because they came to work on the movie set with the same mentality that I always went to work with uh, as a law enforcement officer. They were very serious about what they were doing. Uh, it was very important to them. They showed up on the set every day prepared, ready to go to work, knowledgeable, um, and, and just, I mean, they had some long, massively long days in some very uncomfortable conditions. Um, 
and, and just out when they were grinders. They just fought their way through it, and, and everything was about doing their very best on any given day. And you could always count on that from all. Well, you know, Gerard did another really good movie recently. I don't know if you've seen it or not. It's called Hunter Killer. If you haven't seen it, check it out. I have. I'm a huge fan of this. I'm like uh, a friend, but also a fan. Yeah. So before we wrap things up, is there anything you would like to promote? Um, well, I'm easy to find. If anybody's interested, I have a website. It's www.jdobbins.com. Um, there's links there to, to what I'm doing now and, and uh, some books I've written and some other things that are going on. So I, I'm easy to find. There's an email address there. You can send me a message uh, and you can uh, tone it uh, kindly or you can tone it negatively. I, I read all of them. I try to respond to all of them. I try to, I try to be gracious in my response, even the ones that I receive that might not be so friendly. Uh, tell us the name of your most recent book. My most recent book is called Catching Hell, uh, which is a, a, a memoir of kind of my life and career. Um, that book was uh, predated by a book called No Angel, um, which uh, documented uh, the, the ins and outs and the mechanics and, and my life during the Hell's Angels infiltration. So there's actually, I've written two books that are both on the market. Well, listen, uh, Jay, it's been a real pleasure meeting you. You know, you've lived an extraordinary life with honor and integrity. There's no doubting that. You know, and I'm guessing a lot of people out there are walking around today alive without realizing that you're responsible for their continued existence on this earth, you know, whether it's intercepting drugs or weapons. So, you know, a lot of people, I'm sure, owe their lives to you. If that is uh, truly the case, I cannot think of a higher honor than to have uh, helped improve or save somebody else's life. So thank you for that. That's very kind. Well, thanks for your service, and thank you for appearing on the John Ark Show. Have a good day.